Um, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that there's so many folks in the room today. So it's so lovely to have so many people in the room. Um, thinking about how people learn is a deep passion of mine. And I'd say for me, this is at the heart of my social justice work at a land grant institution. Everything just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yay, we're back. Um, because it's important that all of the folks who are here with all of this incredible knowledge who all do this really important work really think about the ways in which we're ensuring that our students meaningfully understand the work that we do. Um, so thank you for taking that work seriously. Thank you for being here. I hope that this is useful for you. Um, so I'll go through um, a little bit quickly of what we're going to do today. First, a couple of ground rules. If you are joining us through Zoom, and probably I expect that Julie has already um, organized this with them, but if you could um, mute your mics. And then uh, if you have questions, um, they'll chat. You've already up, Julie's gone over it with them. Okay, they'll chat those questions to Julie and she'll share them with me. Please feel free to ask me questions throughout. And because I sometimes um, have short-term memory issues, if I feel like I need to finish making my point, I might say, okay, you write it down so you don't forget your question and I'll come back to that question in just a moment, okay? Um, but do feel free asking questions along the way. I'll also say I do a lot of work with the advanced, uh, the advanced Center here at WVU and one of their ground rules is always trust the process. And I love that ground rule. Um, this is a full hour long session and we take a couple of little detours, um, trust, that I have a vision for how it's all going to come together and if you're along for the ride, we'll get there, okay? Um, real fast, we're gonna start out talking about disciplinarity in the classroom. Um, then we're going to take one of these little cognitive detours and think about schema theory. Um, and I'll do a little mini lecture and we'll meet Sean, we'll watch a video together, um, we'll talk about that video. Then we're gonna talk about some differences between how expert knowledge is structured and how novice knowledge is structured. And having a little bit of background schema theory will help make that useful and accessible to us. Then we're gonna come back into thinking about disciplinarity and pedagogy, okay? Um, then we'll take some questions and then we'll move into the second hour. In the second hour, we'll begin with some discussion while we eat lunch and then we'll really get into the workshop. Um, and that's when Dr. Otten, Dr. Kuhn and I will come around and sort of work with you about maybe potentially revisioning some of our syllabi to be in line with this notion of um, disciplinary teaching. If you brought sil a syllabus, fantastic. If you didn't, it's not a problem. You could totally do this work um, sort of from scratch in a way. All right, any questions before we start? I go fast. And so if you need me to slow down, if you need me to say something again, just let me know. So we're going to start by talking about disciplinarity in the, um, disciplinarity. And there's a beautiful, wonderful researcher named Sam Weinberg who studies how people do work in history. And he studies how historians do their work. And then he looks at how doctoral students do their work in history. And he looks at how high schoolers and kids in school do their work and their families do work around history. And through this work, he's come to really understand differences in how novices and experts engage in the work of history. Ooh. You're fine. We're just going to move it. I did tech in, uh, in theater in college, and so it's like impossible for me to ignore, you know, I'm just supposed to ignore, I can't do that. Like, oh, can I help? What's going on? <laughs> see, that's why we're black. I think I could just like go in and out and no one will see me. All right. Um, so Sam Weinberg really thinks about the ways in which people engage with history. And through this, he's come up with, he's extrapolated from the work of, histor of historians to say, actually, it's, it's not just that we do specialized work in his history, but in all of the disciplines, we have distinct ways of doing our work, not just the content of our work, right? It's not just that, oh, I'm studying history and you're studying physics and you're studying music and what we're, what we're studying is different. But Weinberg goes further to say the disciplines that lend us school subjects, English, history, natural sciences, math, et cetera, possess distinctive logics and modes of inquiry. Now, this may not feel surprising to any of us who've been on, let's say, a cross-college committee, where right, we're having a curriculum discussion or an assessment discussion with someone from a different discipline, and you might feel like you're understanding one another's words, but slightly missing your meanings. 
And it may be that in fact, what's undergirding our discussion are different ways of thinking about modes of inquiry, right? And the logic that undergirds that. Um, Susan Goldman and colleagues from the University of Illinois at Chicago and other institutions around the country are involved in this really incredible project right now called Project Ready. And I should also say that all the citations are at the end of the PowerPoint. So if you don't need to write them down, they'll be there for you. Um, and Goldman builds from people like Weinberg to say, it's not just that there are distinctive logics and modes of inquiry, but they look in particular at argumentation. So if we think about really what's at the root of what we do as scholars, isn't it that we argue? right? We make an argument, we make claims, and we bear, bring evidence to bear on those claims. And this group from UIC and Project Ready, they've looked at the ways in which how we argue looks different from discipline to discipline. Disciplines are, and I love this, if anyone's familiar with Levin Wenger's work around communities of practice, they make this claim that disciplines are communities of practice, right? Each of which has negotiated norms and conventions that shape knowledge claims and argumentation within that disciplinary community. So it's taken as claims, evidence, or principles, and the criteria for valid arguments or explanations differs from discipline to discipline, right? What's a valid claim and good evidence for someone who's dissecting a poem the very nature of that claim, of that evidence, looks really different than someone who's doing work in physics, right? Furthermore, there's different purposes for argumentation. That seems really important, right? That why we argue, why we might bring to bear claims and argumentation, those underlying purposes are different from disciplinary community to disciplinary community. So, um, and those purposes for argumentation coincide with differences in this evidentiary process. So there's a lot of talk about interdisciplinarity. I am all for it. I study interdisciplinarity, but I don't think we can get to interdisciplinarity. We can't start that without understanding the ways in which what our disciplines contribute. Now, um, it may seem obvious in a way to talk about disciplines, in an institution of higher education, right? We are all here probably because we are somehow experts in our fields of study. But with, and we can imagine too, really easily, the ways in which our work looks different. So if you think about a laboratory, a natural sciences laboratory of some sort, and you think about a music studio, and you think about an art studio, and you think about a research lab of economic, you know, e economists, we can so easily imagine how the work in those places looks different. But now think about classrooms across the institution. And I go further to say in particular, think about undergraduate classrooms and think about introductory undergraduate classrooms. So the very things that make our work, our scholarship and our disciplines distinct does not seem to carry over to the ways in which we teach. We tend to, even the most expert scholars fall back on really traditional modes of instruction, like lecture and note taking, which I have to fess up to, sort of what I'm doing right now, right? We don't have a lot of time, so I'm trying to speed through, um, but we will have a few interactive moments, as promised. Um, so that feels strange, right? That what we do as scholars looks so different than what we do as instructors. Um, you'll see I have two images here because they've just come out with a new one. I love these books. The National Academy Press puts out, put out about two decades ago a book called How People Learn. It was written by committee and then so thrilled to see that a couple of months ago they put up How People Learn too. so it's been updated. It's a really, really accessible book that brings together all of the recent and most important um, scholarship on teaching and learning. Because it's National Academies Press, it's all free online. And so if you look it up, you'll be able to download a PDF or you could read it online. They're great books. But here they make the point, right, that expert teachers know the structure of their disciplines. You're good, right? You know the structures of your disciplines. Although sometimes we haven't made those 
the ideas of those structures explicit to ourselves, we start taking them for granted. And we'll do a little bit of work later to start making some, some of what might be tacit explicit. So expert teachers know the, the structures of their disciplines, and this knowledge provides them with cognitive roadmaps that guide the assignments they give students, the assessments they use to gauge students' progress, and the questions they ask in the give and take of classroom life. In short, their knowledge of the discipline and their knowledge of pedagogy interact. And that is a central claim of the work that we're doing today in this workshop, is that disciplinary practices, I'll talk about disciplinary habits of minds, should be what guides your pedagogy. Any questions so far? Great. You have to have a question, so I can take a sip of water. This is a super long quote, and here's the problem. I was an English major, and like I love words. And when people say beautiful things, I want you to hear all of those words too. So I apologize for my super long quote. I will read it aloud. This is Magdalene Lampert, who is a mathematics educator. And here she's talking about um, disciplinary habits of mind in mathematics from the point of view of someone who's a math instructor. And this is what she says teaching math is all about for her. My role was to bring students' ideas about how to solve or analyze problems into the public forum of the classroom, to referee arguments about whether those ideas were reasonable, and to sanction students' intuitive use of mathematical principles as legitimate. I also taught new information in the form of symbolic structures and emphasized the connection between symbols and operations on quantities. But I made it a classroom requirement that students use their own ways of deciding whether something was mathematically reasonable in doing the work. If one conceives of the teacher's role in this way, it is difficult to separate instruction and mathematics content from building a culture of sense-making in the classroom, wherein teacher and students have a view of themselves as responsible for ascertaining the legitimacy of procedures by reference to known mathematical principles. Whoa, that's a lot, right? How many of you are in a field of math or like math? You know, does this feel sort of familiar to the kinds of work that you do? This feels like she's talking the culture, sense, culture of sense making feels reasonable, right? No, not one bit. Are you a math instructor? No. Oh, Steve. Okay. So this I want to be complete gibberish. It's a complete gibberish. Okay. So doesn't this feel really important? One, mathematical teaching sounds like complete gibberish to someone outside of math. So there's some di important disciplinary practices, right? Number two, to what extent do we think that this applies to a high level mathematical doctoral seminar? Does this feel familiar when we're talking about sitting down with our, our doc students, would we be doing this work? Yes, okay. What about the work of an introductory math? let's say a 100 level class, does this feel doable? Yeah. Well, this is a comment because this, the uncommon students, not the teaching students, are responsible for ascertaining the legitimacy of procedures by reference. That's assuming a mind like a students. And my one of the reasons why I'm here in terms of learning is that, that to me, having been here for many years, across all disciplines, that you've got at least 40% of students that you can't get that based on initial buy-in. And if you can work with the better students, you can move them out a little bit better. But how can you get that initial buy-in? Start that even... Okay. So we have a notion that some students can do it and some students aren't interested in doing it. They're here for the wrong reasons or they're not here for the reasons. It's much easier to do this work with the students who are, who are ready to do this work. So I'll make Motivated. it... Motivated. Yeah. So thanks for the plug because session three of how people learn is on motivation. So sign up for session three. Um, but I would also say that I think sometimes what we, uh, we interpret as motivation is something that we have a lot more, um, a lot more ability to shape than we realize. And I think a lot of the time we don't realize the ways in which we can shape that and we, um, 
when we start talking about this, you first need them to show up. <laughs> so I can't help you with that and it probably doesn't make sense for me to spend time today talking about whether or not they show up to your classroom but I certainly will say that there so the question of how people learn is multifaceted Today we're going to talk about work that we can do in our classrooms. These larger questions that have to do with really, I would say some of the structural issues of how institutions are set up and how institutions position students and how we position students as faculty. That's not, um, we just don't have space for it today. Um, but I hope that some of the things that we do touch on over the course of the day might touch on that a little bit. And I would certainly encourage you to come to session three where that will be the heart of what we talk about. Um, okay, I want to go back to this point just about just disciplinary ways of engaging students. Um, and when I've shared this quote with folks before, I often get, I often get um, the response that, I, again, I can imagine doing that, and maybe this comes to the point of motivation. My doctoral student, sure, right? Or maybe a 400 level class. But my intro math class, they can't do this, and they're not interested in doing this. All right, so let's meet Sean. Um, Deborah Ball is a mathematical educator and mathematical researcher. And this is way back when she was, um, she looks, it's in the 80s, it's really different than she does today. Um, this is her third grade classroom. And this is, uh, we're gonna meet Sean. And Sean has been thinking about the number six. And I want you to think about what we've just read in Maggie Lampert's discussion, okay? Where she's talking about, um, the reasonability, like the reasonability of people's claims, sanctioning kids' ideas about math, thinking about symbolic representation, these sort of core practices, habits of mind of mathematicians. And let's see what it looks like um, in her classroom. You have a link to this, and I would recommend maybe just going and following the link. We'll watch for about seven minutes. We'll watch for about 7.05, um, and then we'll come back together to discuss it. <laughs> All right, and this keeps going for a few more minutes. Whoa, right, we all love Sean. We love Sean so much. I teach this video pretty much anytime I can in every single class. All right, uh, let's come back. So, Let's talk a little bit about Deborah Ball's classroom. What does it look like and how does it look a little bit different than a traditional mathematics classroom? And then we'll extrapolate from this a little bit to think about the purpose of what we're doing with our students, okay? Um, so, you talk to me. How does Deborah Ball's classroom look a little bit different than how we, um, than our, maybe, a, again, it could be a traditional third grade classroom. I hope you all enjoy that, you know, step back into the 80s with those cool shoulders on uh, May's purple shirt. I love them. Okay, so uh, where do we want to start? Traditional, Deborah Ball, what looks different? Yeah, no. Uh, students are facing each other, little groups. Okay. Um, what does that suggest pedagogically? Like, what are maybe some undergirding ideas there? We can think back to Maggie Lampert's quote. Oh, there'd be interaction with students that keep discussion. So she talked about creating communities of practice, right? She talked about wanting them to be able to sanction one another's ideas and debate one another's ideas, right? So this, pe this pedagogical design feature, right, allows us to do this. I can't stand it when I talk to teachers. They're like, oh, yeah, I got kids in groups. And then they lecture to them. Like, you have to understand why you're getting kids in groups, right? Are you actually interested in them listening to and responding to one another's ideas? Deborah Ball was not the one who always responded to students' ideas. It was students who responded to one another's ideas. She might have facilitated that. What do people think about Sean's idea? May, do you want to, right? Sorry. But it's also a very small classroom. I, I, mm -hmm. I yes, this is not a lecture of 100 people. No, Absolutely yes. not. In, in, yeah, so this may not work if we have 100 students or even 40 students, right? Yeah. What's our working definition? Not, oh, that's different than how I think, 
right? I also can say that to my student, huh, I didn't read it that way. Tell me more about how you read it, right? But here it's what's, we are a community. This is a community of practice. What's our definition? And do we disagree about it? And it seemed okay that we didn't come to an agreement at the end, right? Okay, that feels really different. And we can think about the range of ways we might do that, not only, even if we have a class of 100 or 150, can we create small online groups through eCampus where they're allowed to be co-creators of knowledge and have those conversations with one another? Yeah. I, I think it's super obviously used to this, right? A typical seven-year-old is not going to say, oh, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. They've been immersed in it, they've been doing this for a while. So there are well-established norms, and I would say most of the other classes in Deborah Ball's class were not doing this. So she established those norms at the beginning of the year. Um, and at this point, they're fairly well rehearsed. They even know how to use this polite language when disagreeing. Huh, we could all learn that sometimes. <laughs> we want to stop it and correct it. What's the value in not stopping and correct it? And I think it's important that we say this out loud, right? Do you want to respond? Yeah. Why does that matter? Who cares? We know that. We know that six is even. Why should they work it out themselves? I don't I know, I know that she did. At the end, he thinks 10 is even at odd. Yeah, she, he's like, thanks. Yeah, you're right. 10 is also even at odd. Yeah. The things that we realize for ourselves are the lessons we think. Why is that, though? That sounds lovely. Oh, say, say that again, I'm sorry. Once we've set a path of logic, we're going to have a that it six. Okay, so it's not just that we wanted to memorize that six is even or odd. We wanted to engage Sean in the logic of mathematics. And the only way to do that was to have this argument become explicit, to figure out what are the, what are the norms for this argument, right? What are the rules for this argument? How do we politely engage with one another, respect each other as co-creators of knowledge? It seems mad to me, mad. My students will always, we talk about this all the time. There's this traditional discourse practice that we recognize right when we study classrooms called IRE, initiation, response, evaluation. Initiation comes from the teacher. I'm going to ask you a question. Response comes from the student, I'm going to answer, and I'm going to tell you, evaluation, are you correct or incorrect? I do it all the time, and I've studied this, right? It just is such a typical norm, I-R-E, I-R-E. What do we do when we are the evaluators, right? To what extent do we limit the process making? But when does the most productive conversation happen? When someone's wrong. Right? We talk about an innovation all the time. Aren't we so pleased that we are Carnegie One, you know, Research One status? We got there because we've disagreed with the people who have come before us. That's what innovation is about. That is how we produce new ideas, right? Is we don't think the ideas that exist really are good enough, right? Or we think they could be refined or made better. Why is it that we somehow think that we sh our students shouldn't go through that same, you called it a cognitive path, which I thought was so beautiful, right? And then it, it means something to them. I would go a step further. Deborah Ball might say, and I have students, teacher education students, who really have a hard time with this. It may, to me, it's not important that Sean goes home and knows if Sixers even are odd. And I've had student teachers who have said, uh, uh, no, he has got to know it's <laughs> six. <laughs> but to me, Sean understands how to reason mathematically. So that anytime a new problem is presented, he's able to engage with it as an agent, right? An agentive force. Okay, we're gonna keep going for sake of time, but I think we could, we could keep going here, right? And some of these things feel potentially replicable in our classrooms and some don't because we have larger classes perhaps, but you might wanna think about refinements like the fact that, okay, I don't have a, um, I don't have a class of 25 or whatever she has in the room, but I do have eCampus and maybe I'm allowed to create some, uh, able to create some small groups that replicate some of, some of that work. Um, did anyone else have a hand up that I missed, or did you have a burning, or something you wanted to add? Yeah, please. Well, I feel like this is a prime example that I really want to emphasize. So I'm from 
South Korea. Mm. Korea, Japan, China, Singapore, those are the ones math and science is top five. America is about 17. But guess what? Who got more Nobel Prize? All Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Singapore, all combined far less than what American people actually got Nobel Prize. You think it's a prime example of why? I will. In our culture, when I was back then, that was about decades ago, this issue could be solved in five minutes because the teacher will define it. The odd number is any number can be divided by two. One minute, the rest of the time is practice. So we give hundreds of questions, seven yes. divided by two, three and a half. No. So we know exactly within five minutes. Yeah. But guess what? If we face completely different issues and questions, then we completely forgot how to get there. This is the prime example that you guys teach. You argue each other, you think about it, then you create it, this is your class. And then they begin to understand this is wrong, this is right. That's how actually we should learn. It's not like memorization. So our case, my example is all Asians, 14 hour day, literally from Monday through Saturday, we study. So 14 hours a day, we practice free throw. Yes. <laughs> Americans, maybe five minutes a day, but then all of a sudden somebody showed up and let's compete. South Korean versus American kid, we're gonna compete free throw. Who's gonna win? We should win. I mean, if we lose, we're stupid, really. But that doesn't mean we know how to play basketball. But you teach how to play basketball. That system, that's a logical thinking. That's the biggest difference between our culture, your culture, eventually you. That is the example. That's powerful. Yeah, I saw, I've seen two hands. I don't know if you want to, and then also green and turquoise, you guys fight it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I that's really powerful. About the importance of not stifling like creative thinking and discussion and all that. But at the, one of the challenges, just like Ella brought up, that a different challenge that I find in the classroom is not only the variety of learning styles, but the difference in the people's background and where they're at. And it just gets, as the classroom gets larger, then yeah. the problem just inflates. And so while some people, it was clear that Sean and May they were ready for multiplication and division, and they were right on top of it. But I heard her, there was someone that I would always say she chastised. She said, like, are, like, are you paying attention? Or, you know, I think there might have been one or two kids there that, that weren't so enthralled with the seven-minute discussion. And in fact, if they were confused, if they were truly confused, well, I guess Sean is truly confused about odd and even numbers, it is not helping them. It's not clarifying their confusion. Yeah. So we're going, to get, we're going to get to something that will answer that in a moment. I do, we've got about half an hour of lecture left in about 15 minutes. And these issues and the bits and pieces will address that. But let me hear this last point. No, and I then, say, I, yeah. I think it brings up a great point, but I think that this class that we just observed is not the standard. This is not the standard, and I would agree. This is not what a traditional math classroom looks like in third grade. I promise you, because I visit them. <laughs> I learned from here yeah. to incorporate discussions of my class. Usually, I do not use the slide. Mm. To give them a project, the topic, let's talk about it. So that is the how because the slide yeah. already, when they look at the slide, their way of thinking is locked up mm -hmm. because I'm being drawn into the mm -hmm. slide. I, I think about this all the time in my classroom. What are the ways in which we dictate authority or we imply authority? Texts imply authority. Slides imply authority. Just being an instructor implies authority. And I feel like all the time, every day, especially from class one, right? Whoever said the norms seem to have been established really early on, I am trying to undermine that authority, right? And so I'll say things like, I'll acknowledge someone, thank you so much for bringing that up, that you thought six was even and odd. It seems like we've come around as a community to thinking it's, odd, uh, thinking it's even, <laughs> but what an amazing conversation you started for us, right? And acknowledging that, again, mistakes are the kinds of things that drive us, but you have to work really, really hard to upend, and back to this point, 
a system that has a history to it, right? And those histories are really hard to upend. And I'm constantly, I sort of joke at home, but I'm constantly like unschooling my kids, right? Because so much, I'll say, oh, no, 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 that's not science. You haven't learned any science yet. Don't tell me you don't like science. You don't like memorizing terms in a textbook, right? And filling them in the blanks, but none of that is actually science. So don't say you don't like science. Um, oh, it's a tough fight sometimes. All right. Really, really fast. Schema theory. Schema theory is just one way of externalizing knowledge, representing knowledge, so we can think about it and talk about it, okay? Knowledge and thinking is invisible, and yet we want to be able to analyze it, we want to be able to talk about it the way we're doing now. So schema theory is a way of doing that, and there are other ways too, and later we'll, I'll show you some examples of mental models. I'm gonna go with schema because uh, schema theory tends to just be sort of generative for my students to make sense to them, okay? So, <clears throat> classic tabla rasa, right? If we think about our students as blank slates, if we think about them as not knowing anything, an empty bucket, it feels like pretty great that we could fill it up just the way we want to, right? If I lecture, right, you, the words I say will be perfectly emblazoned onto your blank slate. All of the words I say, now you will have in you, right? Beautiful. Okay, we're good to go. Let's keep going, right? Oh, actually, most of our kids don't look like a blank slate. There's a lot of stuff in their brains already. And so if we do a beautiful, perfect lecture and we're layering it on top of that, maybe some stuff is going to get lost. We won't be able to see it as well, right? Yeah. And also adding our brains are designed to forget. It takes work, and that's exactly where we're going with this. So if we've got a mess of stuff, it's less likely we're going to remember it, right? Because there's a lot of stuff that's getting in the way. And some of it might fall neatly onto a white part of the board, but some of it might fall like right where there's a lot of text there, right? And we might be thinking about something else or we might make an association with something that we did not want our students to make an association with. And they're gonna get deep down and lost in that corner of the board. Here's a quickie on schema theory. So the idea of schema theory, and again, it's just one way of representing knowledge but the big ideas here relate to all the other ways of thinking about how we can represent knowledge. All knowledge is packaged into units. And this is old school. This is David Rommelhart, 1980. But man, it's still packed a punch. These units are the schemata. And embedded in these packets of knowledge is, in addition to the knowledge itself, information about how that knowledge is used. So you were saying before that it's almost like it's a sieve, right? We lose a lot of information. It's not just that. We often hold on to a ton of useful information that we don't realize we should be deploying in the moment. Okay, and we, we can, we'll talk about that next time when we talk about transfer. Um, so we've got this knowledge and it's pretty well structured and the ways in which it's structured determine how we use it. So schemata are the building blocks of cognition. They're these fundamental elements upon which all information processing depends. They're employed in the process of interpreting new data, right? In retrieving information from memory, in organizing actions, in determining goals and sub goals, allocating cognitive resources, right? So these schemata guide our cognition, they guide how we think and how we use our knowledge. So now, rather than thinking about the gobbledygook that's up on the screen, it's actually we know that our students' knowledge is pretty well organized. It may not be organized the way we think it should be organized or how it makes sense to us, but they do have a ton of knowledge and it's pretty well organized. So this may help us when thinking about finding a way in What's a node of the schema that I can connect to? Or what's a node of the schema that actually is just dead wrong when it comes to the way I'm teaching this? And I need to help my students see how to reframe it. Do you have a question? 
<laughs> All right. So we were going to build a schema together. I like to build a schema of sheets because when I came to West Virginia, I'd never seen the sheets before. My students had a lot to say about sheets. I was going to use WVU football because I thought that we'd all share a lot of information about WVU football and we could think about ways of organizing that information. But then we also might have really different ideas about WVU football, right? For some of us, that might be the core purpose of what WVU is all about. And some of us might see it as a huge distraction, right? And so our schemata might differ from person to person, right? And then we might think about if we were to, let's say, teach a history of sport at this institution, how we might need to consider our students' differencing, difference, different, differentiate, differentiated Schema. Schemata. <laughs> um, and so I would say that sometimes we think about students either as having the prior knowledge they need or not. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize is it's not just do they have the information they need, but what kinds of information do they have? How is it structured? And what's my way in? And because different students will have different kinds of schemata related to the topics we're teaching, and because the thing that we are, let's, let's say, calling cognition, half of our class thinks about it in one way, two people over here think about it in another way, and someone over here is thinking about something completely different, right, conversion, right? We have to find ways of figuring out how does our students understand this thing that we're teaching, right? And what are the range of ways in which we're gonna connect into it? So we're not gonna build a schema of WPO football as, as fun as that would have been. All right. I love playing this game. Even though we have like seven minutes, we're playing this game. We're doing it. I just got a puppy. Isn't he cute? I've never had a dog before in my life. So this is brand new. Sometimes 10 year olds are like super duper convincing and I'm an idiot, but we have a puppy at home. All right, who here's an expert in dog walking? Awesome, okay. One of you, I need to volunteer and come up to the front of the class. Um, and who has like maybe walked a dog for a neighbor once or twice, or like they had a dog as a kid but didn't really walk it? I have a couple of kids like that. <laughs> Anybody know? I figured dog walking would be easy. Anyone sort of on occasion has walked a dog? Yes. Okay. We're going to start with you actually. Okay. <laughs> would you mind sharing with the group? You're going to tell us, teach us a little bit of how to walk a dog. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do it, and then we're going to take a couple of questions. Okay. 30 seconds, how to walk a dog, go. Um, I don't know, put, put them on a leash, you make sure you have a bag and whatever else you need in order to accomplish your goal and, um, I don't know, evaluate what's going on outside, if it's raining, you know, whatever else I might need and then uh, we, we go, we go on a walk and we just sort of follow the rules the best we can and he sort of does what he wants most of the time, but, and then I try to prevent him from doing those things. <laughs> and I try to anticipate, like, what else is down the road? Is there anything that he can sniff or pick up or eat that I don't want him to do? Zigzag, while still maintaining some sort of structure for him, you know, to form good habits. Lovely. Tell me your name. Alex. Alex. Thank you, Alex. Questions for Alex, indeed. Excellent. I learned something. <laughs> um, questions for Alex about dog walking? From anyone maybe who doesn't know a lot about dog walking and who does? I need one question. What, yes. what, oh. is, what if your dog, you're walking someone else's dog and the dog doesn't want to go to the dog? Yeah. What would you do? I mean, it's tough because it's a dog, but I think that's where it's like sort of discipline comes from and and for him to, the dog to understand, like it should have, it's, it was, Dog can't really participate in self-reflection. I think it can, which is um, how I re relate that to what we were talking about previously. But you sort of have to do it for him, and it's the owner should have instilled in him that you, you don't go, you don't, we don't go, but you can't go inside the house. Right. So there's yeah. so as a guest dog, dog walker, you can't help with that. But as the the, the owner of that dog, that should have been well established beforehand. There's a protocol for that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I need an expert dog walker. Okay. You got 30 seconds, maybe 45, go. Okay, so as, as the background wrong here, establish ground rules when you have a puppy, like in that in that uh, classroom, and then you take him to a place where you can just go, and you just go and let your dog run. 
and what the ground rules are established for when the grizzly can come right then to your knee. But other than that, he enjoys the walk and I enjoy the walk. And that's what we do every day, no matter by or shine. And so pretty much on his own, um, but with certain ground rules, experiencing whatever there is to experience in limits. And you do this, and that's just a thing. There's no I want to or not uh, on either side. Okay. And any questions for our expert dog walker? What if you didn't establish <laughs> <laughs> And can you come to my house? <laughs> Those good ground rules. So what if that hasn't happened? Well, if you have a pup, I mean, any kind of dog is a dog, and dogs are still animals, so the, the danger of either a dog running away getting hurt or a dog attacking somebody or somebody or another person's dog this needs to be established and it needs some kind of discipline. Uh, and depending on who needs to establish, you are the, 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 main, the main, the top person, and he has to, he or she has to just obey, period. He just has to follow. So that needs to be established or just work. Um, and leash is only go so far. It's okay. best that the dog just has this imaginary leash. So, quickly. I was just going to ask, is there, are there different ground rules for different breeds of dogs? Ah, that's an excellent question, but we don't have time for it today. So <laughs> how can people learn 1.2, and it will be about dog walking, and I'm coming to that, and you guys are teaching. <laughs> okay. Did anyone notice any differences between the ways in which our, our and tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Margaret, Margaret thank you. Alex, right? Between how Alex and Margaret describe the process of dog walking to us and how they answer their questions. Yeah. Write it out. Um, Alex's was a little bit more step by step, like a applied, and I felt like Margaret's was more theoretical. Like, here's how it's done well, and Alex kept told, okay, you're going to get this, you're going to get this, you're going to do step one, step two. So, so Alex was thinking, in the moment, what am I doing? Um, Margaret had some overarching principles that were organizing and guiding, right? Okay. Ned? I was going to say the same thing. Uh, I was going to say, sorry, I forgot. Alex. Uh, Alex um, kind of went into it like the dog knows what it needs to do, mm. and I'm just here to be the one to take it outside. But it kind of like we're going to do this together, but it kind of already has <coughs> the groundwork established to be able to pretty much walk itself. Got it. And the expert um, laid it out within the system. So it wasn't just the dog as the agent, I'm following the dog, but in fact, there's an entire system here. There are different roles. She's assigned roles, right? There's a the range of context. So we go to this place where it's okay to do these things, and it's different than this place where it's not okay to do these things. Okay. It is just about noon. I'd say I have about 10 minutes of the lecture left. And I know they're here. Okay. Awesome. Great. I apologize in advance if the food is cold. Um, if anyone must go now, by all means go. Um, we'll do about 10 more minutes, then we're going to go into the food and a bit of the workshop. Okay. Um, and apologies for going a little long. So, a lot of people study expert and novice differences. Um, some of the classic work comes from Michelle Chi, who's CHI, um, who studies um, chess players. And in particular, her work with chess players brought home number one here. Experts notice features and meaningful patterns, we might call them concepts, right, of information that are not noticed by novices. So Michelle Chi and her colleagues gave uh, novices and expert chess players boards, chess board boards, that where a couple of moves have already happened. And the experts were able to think, right, many, many moves ahead. They could see the range of patterns. Oh, this person is playing in this type of style, right? Um, and the novices saw none of that. The novices saw what comes next, right? Sort of, um, so if it's raining, I guess I'll put on my coat, not, there are a range of weather options, and these are the ways in which you might, you know, approach those options, okay? We do the same thing with classrooms. We show novice teachers and expert teachers' classrooms, and what the experts see is very different from what the novices see. Experts have acquired a great deal of content knowledge. Okay, we know that. We know our boards are full. 
but this is what's also important, that knowledge is organized in a way that reflects a deep understanding of the subject matter. Here's a key point I want you to think about. We do not teach discrete ideas. We do not teach, we do not know discrete pieces of information. They're well organized. And I'm making the case here, in part they're organized by our disciplinary ways of knowing habits of mind, right? And so if you're teaching students those ways of knowing, it helps them cohere the information. What's important for your students to walk away with at the end of your class? Even thinking about your introductory surveys, is it important for them to walk away knowing that there were seven different theorists with seven different big ideas about, let's say, cognitive psychology? Or is it important that they understand the purpose of what a cognitive psychologist does, how they think and reason about the world, right? And maybe along the way, they've picked up some of that discrete content. And I would say, as someone who does research in this world and has reads a lot about this world, in fact, that is exactly the case, right? That when we teach ideas in this discrete way without these content structures that cohere them the way they cohere for experts, that knowledge sticks. If we teach them to memorize the great theorists and three things about each of their ideas, that is gone. That is not achievable later. So was that, was that a useful semester? You know, you feel like, check, that's what my colleagues expected me to do. But was that purposeful or useful in terms of what the students walked away with? Um, expert knowledge cannot be reduced, as I've sort of just said, to isolated facts but that it is deployed in context. They understand how it's applicable. And this is also an important feature of experts, that they can flexibly retrieve relevant knowledge, so this comes back to this idea of transfer that we sort of touched on before, as they need it. There's a, a wonderful scholar, um, Mello Silver, who looks at the difference between the expert knowledge of, and we're gonna look at her work in a minute actually, of a fish tank, between a fish tank hobbyist and a biologist who studies economic, uh, environmental systems. The expert hobbyist knows as much about that fish tank as the, the biologist, but the biologist can apply all of those same frameworks to any system, aquatic system, and the hobbyist is really limited. So the hobbyist doesn't have that flexible retrieval. And this is something that we teach, we need to teach explicitly, this idea of flexible retrieval and something we'll talk about next session and, and when we talk about transfer. Okay, this is a little, this is a little uh, blurry, I apologize. But this is that biologist schema of a fish tank, okay? And so Mello Silver interviewed all these biologists, want to understand what they understood about fish tanks. And you can see how their knowledge is really well organized, right? So there are nodes, and from those nodes, we might have a range of different ideas, okay? Um, here's another expert schema. Pam Grossman studies teacher knowledge. And again, teachers have deep and meaningful expert knowledge that's organized into these different, these different nodes, these different groupings, okay? When you say, temperature to someone who's studying an aquatic system or oxygen. What you have behind that term or even that concept is the entirety of your schema. And you're just, all you're able to do is give out that, that word. And it's really hard sometimes for us as instructors to know or to realize how that concept is limited for our students because we can't detach everything we know about oxygen, right, when we're talking about an aquatic system. And it's really hard for us to even know how complex our notion of oxygen is, right? So we say these distinct ideas, we put them up on the board, and for us, you can think about all of the knowledge that's connected to all of those discrete pieces that help it cohere for us. But it doesn't necessarily cohere for our students. This gets back into this idea of 
higher knowledge, what are my students to know? Now we cannot just fill them all the buckets. That's impossible. But again, that's my sort of claim of this work is to say, but if we get students to think about how we work in disciplinary ways, they know how to build that up themselves. So if we shift our work from rather than saying, I want to make sure you know all of the pieces related to this aquatic system, and instead we say, what are the range of ways we should attack this aquatic system? What are the things we should find out about it? And then how will we find out about it? Then we, in fact, have been much more productive with them in a long-lasting kind of way. What do student schemas look like? So this is uh, work from Stella Vosnia do with kids to understand mental models of the earth. And I'm only going to um, read the first little bit for you. Um, so they ask kids, what does the earth look like? And they're interested in the shape of the earth and gravitational force. So what's the real shape of the earth? Round, why does it look flat? Because you are inside the earth. So if you walked and walked for many days in a straight line, where would you end up? Somewhere in the desert. And what if you kept walking? You'd go to states and cities. And what if you kept walking? No response. Would you ever reach the edge of the Earth? No, you just have to be in a spaceship if you're going to go off the edge of the Earth. Is there an edge to the Earth? No, only if you go up. Okay, and it keeps going. She has all of these amazing interviews. And they interviewed a ton of kids. And these are kids' mental models of Earth and gravitational force. Okay? Yeah, some of these are wacky. What's my point here? So sometimes we say something like, gravitational force. And here is an image of the Earth as an, Ned, excuse me, and any of the physicists, please, this is, but this is supposed to be a representation of how gravitational forces differentiatingly sort of pull on the Earth, okay? Okay, expert image that I don't understand, but I'm an expert in that. We say gravitational force in the shape of the Earth, and as an expert, we're thinking this. We've cut out that word, right? But our students are thinking this. So one of the things, and what do we do with that, right? So how is the rest of our lecture going to go? And we put out this one idea, this term that we're assuming that we're sharing some knowledge. And not only is it that ours is so much more robust than theirs, but in fact, it's that it's just sort of wrong for the kinds of academic and scholarly knowledge we're trying to promote in a place like this. Okay. So what do we do? By engaging students in disciplinary practices and making explicit disciplinary habits of mind, we make it unnecessary to share all the knowledge, which we can't do, we just can't do it, right? But as students become agents to work out understanding on their own, right, they have the capability of delving into and figuring out what ultimately we want them to know. Costa and Kalik make this point. They're some of the people who sort of think about this notion of habits of mind. When we teach for habits of mind, we're interested also in students behave when they don't know an answer, not just when they, how to get the answer, right? But what do they do when they don't have the answer? The habits of mind are performed in response to the questions and problems the answer switch are not immediately known. Okay, so what we're going to do after we've had lunch, um, and I, is I'd like you to be able to reflect on your disciplines a little. And that same group, Susan Goldman and colleagues um, from Project Ready, who think about disciplinary practices in terms of argumentation, have come up with these core constructs and definitions of these important elements of our disciplines. Epistemology. What are the ways of the understanding the world and understanding knowledge that undergird our disciplines, right? This differs from discipline to discipline, and I'll also say this often disciplines, with, this changes within a discipline. What are our inquiry practices? How do we, um, what are the ways in which we ask questions and seek out answers in our disciplines? What are those overarching concepts and principles? How do we represent information and share it with one another? We heard Maggie Lampert talk about mathematics, right? That's sim a lot of symbolic representation. And then what are the ways in which we communicate? What are discourse and language structures? So what I'd like to do as you eat, I was going to give you all um, a few minutes to just sort of quietly reflect on this, but because lunch is right outside and I want you to eat, what I might suggest that we do is this. I'd like to take, um, maybe uh, get your food, sit down, think about this a little bit, and maybe in, in 10, 15 minutes, I'll ask you to, although you know what, you're probably ready to talk. Why don't you just, here's the thing I'd like you to think about. Talk 
to one another about challenges. And this is, I know what so many of you are thinking, right? This is our instinct is to say like, oh my God, there's so many reasons why this can't work in my classroom. Okay, let's get it out. Let's talk about it. Okay, so that's what we'll do over lunch. Then we'll take a few minutes to reflect on this. And then we're going to talk about how we bring this into a discussion of pedagogical design. How can this, thinking about the core constructs of our discipline, shape the way we think about designing our courses? Okay, so 15 minutes, eat, talk about challenges. You can even potentially talk about overcoming those challenges. And then we'll come together and work on our syllabi. All right? Thank you so, so much. Rather than taking a big Q&A, I'm just going to sort of stand here, and if people have questions, come talk to me because I feel badly that we've put lunch off for so long. And in terms of the Zoom folks, did any questions come through on chat? All right. And I'm here, and I could talk to them as well. Okay. I'm so sorry that I, I made lunch go late, guys. Thank you for sticking with me for the first hour. <laughs>